In this video, we are going to take some sample practice questions on AWS Cloud Practitioner exam. Now friends, AWS Cloud Practitioner exam is one sure shot way for you to start building a promising career in cloud computing. And the best part is that you are starting with AWS, which is the leading cloud provider in the industry. And yes, markets are high and salaries are good. So friends, in case you are also preparing for the AWS Cloud Practitioner exam and you think that your preparations are done, you are through with the course content, then this video gives you a chance to test your knowledge and understanding of the AWS concepts against the real exam like questions. And of course, through these videos, you will understand the core AWS concepts. And not just that, I will also share some AWS documentation so that you can do some self-learning and also validate the answer. So what are we waiting for? Let's jump on to the very first question. So let's begin part 19 with question number 171. The question is saying to maximize the value of their purchase on Amazon EC2 reserve instances across all the departments, a large company needs to manage their AWS accounts in an efficient manner. Now to do this, they require a service or a tool that will enable them to share reserve instances between different departments even when some of the departments are over purchased while the others are underutilized. And also the question is saying that each department currently has its own AWS account. Each department has purchased Amazon EC2 reserve instances. With this in mind, which Amazon service or tool should the company select? And your options are option A, AWS system manager, option B, cost explorer, option C, AWS trusted advisor, and lastly, option D, AWS organizations. Friends, the correct answer to this question is option D, AWS organization. And the reason is very simple. The question is asking you to manage efficiently the resources. In this case, it is Amazon EC2 reserve instances. So the company wants to manage all the reserve instances across all the departments. And the best way to do is, is AWS organizations. Because it is the AWS organization that stretches across all the departments of the company. And that's how the AWS organization provides a control across the board, across each department of your company. Now let's get some more details on the AWS organization. Here you can see that AWS organization centrally manage your environment as you scale your AWS resources. So here you can see that with the use of AWS organization, you can quickly scale your environment by programmatically creating new AWS accounts for your resources and teams with no additional charge. Not just that, with the use of AWS organization, you can simplify the user-based permission management to give the teams freedom to build while staying within the targeted governance boundaries. And here is how it works. So here you can understand how the AWS organization works out. So let me zoom it a little bit more. So here you can see that the AWS organization lets you create new AWS account at no additional charge. With these accounts in the organization, you can easily allocate the resource and also you can group the accounts and apply governance policies to the accounts or the groups. So here you can see that we have AWS organization. We can create accounts under the organization. We can add the accounts, group the accounts. So in case you have multiple departments, you can group all them together, control all of them together and further assign the policies and based on these policies, you can also assign some AWS services. So this is how the AWS organization gives you the central control. Okay, so now let's move on to the next question. Question number 172, it says as a system administrator, how would you add an additional layer of login security to a user's AWS management console? And your options are option A, use Amazon Cloud Directory Option B, audit AWS identity and access management roles. Option C, enable multi-factor authentication. And lastly, option D, use AWS Trust Advisor. And the correct answer for this question is option C, enable multi-factor authentication. So friends, the multi-factor authentication is a simple best practice that adds an extra layer of protection on the top of a username and the password. With the multi-factor authentication enabled, when a user sign in to the AWS management console, they will be prompted for their username and the password. So this will be the first factor, which is also known as what they know, as well as the authentication code from their MFA device, this is the second factor what they have. And I'm sure that all of us have already used the multi-factor authentication. And these days, my friends, MFA is so important. You log into any credentials, you log into your company's account, you log into your personal email IDs as well. 
in all the logins to provide the extra layer of security so the sms that you receive on your mobile phones or maybe you're using some other tool for example microsoft authenticator or maybe google authenticator that all are example of multi-factor authentication so i hope you understood the concept of multi-factor authentication but then as always i will not leave you without the documentation so here you can read about the multi-factor authentication which is an aws identity and access management best practice that requires a second authentication factor in addition to the username and the password and friends as far as the AWS cloud practitioner exam goes you don't have to get into the details of the multi-factor authentication the implementation of the same you just need to understand the concept and where it is implemented and with that let's move on to the next question question number 173 which says which of the following are the features of network ACLs as they are used in AWS cloud and you have to pick two correct options your options are option A they are stateless option B they are stateful Option C, they evaluate all the rules before allowing the traffic. And option D, they process rules in order, starting with the lowest number rule when deciding whether to allow traffic. And option E, they operate at an instance level. And the correct answer is option A, they are stateless. So friends, the network ACLs are stateless as we see here, which basically means that the responses to the allowed inbound traffic are subject to the rules for outbound traffic and also the vice versa. And in case you really want to understand the details, this is the documentation. This documentation tells you that the network access control list allows or denies specific inbound or outbound traffic at the subnet level. And you can use the default network ACL for your VPC or you can also create a custom network ACL for your VPC with the rules that are similar to the rules for your security groups in order to add an additional layer of security for your VPC. And here you can also understand with this diagram how this all works. You can use the router network ACL group A and network ACL group B. As I told before, the network ACL works on the subnet level. And now that we understand what is network ACL, let's find out the second correct option and that is option D. They process the rules in order starting with the lowest number rule when deciding whether to allow traffic. And with that, let's quickly jump to the next question, question number 174 that says that you want to store huge amount of data, which is basically images or documents on AWS storage service S3, which of the following is accounted as the cost of S3 storage. And again, you have to choose two correct options. Your options are option A while uploading data to an S3 bucket, option B lifecycle transition request, option C outbound data transfer from S3 in West US to another EC2 instance in West US. And then we have option D, outbound data transfer to Amazon CloudFront. And then we have option E, outbound data transfer from S3 from East US to an EC2 instance in West US. And the first correct option is option B, lifecycle transition request. And then the second correct option is outbound data transfer from S3 in US East to an EC2 instance in West US. Moving on with the question number 175, it says the AWS global infrastructure consists of regions, availability zone and what else? And your options are option A, VPCs, option B, data centers, option C, dark fiber network links and lastly option D, edge locations. And I'm really sure that you already guessed the answer and that is option D, edge locations. And friends, just to elaborate the concept, I'm sure that you must have heard about the data caching. Now the data caching or simply caching is the process of storing files in a cache or a temporary storage location. For example, a web browser caches the HTML files, JavaScript or sometimes images in order to load the websites quicker. And similarly, using edge networking services ensures that your user facing data is transmitted securely and quickly over the World Wide Web. And these services move your data away from the risk of the internet and place them in the protective walls of AWS Global Network. And yes, my friends, in case you're looking for the best courses on both Microsoft Azure and Amazon AWS, then to help you out, I've shared some links from Udemy, Coursera and Skillshare in the description box. All the courses are offering the best discounts, so please check them out. So friends, those were five latest and important questions on AWS Cloud Practitioner exam. In case you like the question, please do give this video a thumbs up. Do subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon for more such upcoming videos on both Amazon AWS and Microsoft Azure. So that's all for today. I will see you in the next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching.